as, as exciting that, as that was, we have more exciting news. And I get to introduce uh, Dr. Willie Chi, who's a specialist in uh, vascular and endovascular care, and he is uh, leading some really exciting studies at um, UC Davis. Um, this trial that he's going to um, tell us about that was just launched uses a patient's own stem cells to increase blood circulation out to um, the lower extremities. And, you know, the goal of this, as he'll tell you, is to prevent amputations. That's the goal. That's what we're doing. And this is um, just bringing so much hope to so many patients. And we're going to have the opportunity to hear from a patient after Dr. Chi is done. So um, I'm really pleased to introduce to you Dr. Willie Chi to tell us about the work that he is doing. Thank you, Dr. Pomeroy, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My topic for the day is primarily talking about peripheral arterial disease. And for those of you who wonder what is PAD, well, it is peripheral arterial disease. You probably see it on TV all the time. But the definition of peripheral arterial disease is really atherosclerosis or manifestation of atherosclerosis evolving the arterial system in the lower extremities. Now, the, I want to give you a uh, brief summary of the epidemiology of PAD in the States. PAD does affect patients in the elderly population. So if you were to look at patients older than the age of 75, about one in five of those patients will have the diagnosis or carry the diagnosis of PAD. But what's more surprising is that currently, as of 2010, there are about 18 million patients that do carry the diagnosis of PAD, and that number will go up to 21 million in the age of 2020. But what is most astonishing is that uh, an annual cost of about $4.4 billion is spent only on, primarily on critical limb ischemia, which I will be talking about just in a little bit. And to overall, the overall cost of PAD care goes up to $102 billion based on reach registry and study done at University of Minnesota by Alan Hirsch's group. So just like any disease, a disease has a spectrum of manifestation. Patient with PAD could certainly present with no symptoms at all to those with a little bit of leg pain, as you can see, uh, the gentleman on the very left uh, of the screen, to those who have resting leg pain, and that we consider as being having critical limb ischemia, to those patients who actually end up with a gangrene or a non-healing ulceration because lack of arterial supply. Now, despite of the innovation in the last decades of surgical and endovascular care as well as medical therapy, amputation could still happen in these patients. So where are we in terms of PAD treatment in the year of 2011? Medical exercise therapy as well as endovascular and surgical therapy is still the standard of care. Now I will be talking to you a little bit on the, in the research setting about the cell-based and growth factor therapy that currently is ongoing at UC Davis Vascular Center along with Jan Nota's lab. So, what about medical and exercise therapy? Do, does it work? Well, it certainly does work. Currently, there's one medication that is PAD specific in relieving patients' claudication distance, as well as exercise, which actually has been proved over the last decades of uh, that it does improve circulation in patients with PAD. The combination of those two therapies are beneficial for those patients simply having intermittent claudication. So, where do the surgical bypass and the endovascular therapy comes into place? Well, it is really uh, designated for patients who are refractory to medical therapy or those patients that who suffer from critical limb ischemia who really don't have any time to wait. And as you can see from the bypass, really just literally mean bypass, you actually bypass the area of stenosis, you hook up an artery that's proximal to the area of stenosis to an artery that is distal to the stenosis, hoping that the blood will flow right way. And the endovascular wise, we could certainly thread a catheter into the artery and deploy a balloon as well as a stent to open up the vessel. So you, you would open up the lumen so that there's more blood flow down towards the extremity to heal either the resting leg pain or the ulceration or the digital gangrene. So this is actually an arteriogram of an actual patient who is a great candidate for having either bypass surgery or endovascular therapy, simply because, as you can see distally, the femoral artery is still intact. Yeah, you do have proximal occlusion of the artery, but you can see that there's really no, um, both of the proximal femoral artery are occluded with the distal reconstitution. Now, what about this patient? Well, those two patients, they have really no conduits to bypass to, nor can you intervene because there's really no name vessels. All you see are just collateral vessels. So do we just hand our hats and say, well, we'll give up and pray with the patient? Or do we 
think about some way of rebuilding these vessels to save the patients from amputation or to save the patient from not sleeping at night because of the resting leg pain. So here on my left or on your left is actually a uh, electronics um, uh, microscopy of actually vessel in growth. And you can see on the right hand side is that there's a slide telling you about the milieu of how a vessel form. It requires different type of cells and different, uh, different type of gene factor to come into place to form new blood vessels. So when we talk about stem cell therapy and gene factor therapy, we really talk about collaboration of the two. The way to think about stem cell is a factory of these factors. And like I said, like I mentioned in the cartoon, that there are a host of different factors that to be entertained. One's VEGF, which is on top, it stands for vasoendothelial growth factor, and then HGF, hepatocyte growth factor. Down the bottom is FGF, fibroblast growth factor, as well as HIF1 alpha, which stands for hypoxia induced factor one alpha. Now, so when we run clinical trial, then the question comes, what patient do we select for? And what cells to use? And which growth factor do we need to optimally produce? As well as the way to optimally deliver these cells? Well, at least I can answer the first question because most of the gene factor therapy as well as the stem cell therapy are for patients with critical lip ischemia that do not have any surgical or endovascular option. So here is something from Jen Oza's lab looking at a mice model where the femoral artery is ligated without the branch sever. And what you do see on top is that this is a laser Doppler view of um, the mouse leg before the surgery. And then on the bottom, it's after the surgery where you don't see any more blood flow. Now, what happens after is marrow stem cell is injected through the tail vein of the mice. And what you do see is that there's a homing phenomenon where these cells actually goes to the area of hypoxia or the area that needs the most rebuilding. Now, this is another, another, another slide looking at the VEGF uh, in terms of wound healing that you can see on your left-hand side that uh, with the ones that do get uh, VEGF, that there is definitely a much uh, higher or faster closure rate and then much higher and faster blood flow rate as compared to control or these other factors. So to answer the second question, what cell do we use at UC Davis right now? Well, I think that MSC or mesenchymal stem cell as well as VEGF as a factor is certainly a candidate in development simply because the fact that MSC does, um, does have a lot of efficacy and it's relatively safe, that it has been proven that there's in vitro expression of VEGF from the MSC, that there is no autonomic or auto feedback or positive feedback to the cell because these MSC do not have VEGF receptors. And then there is sustaining or long expression phenomenon. And as well as the fact that these cells do homing into the area of need, of need which is the tissue hypoxia. Now this is actually a cartoon given to me by Jan Nota looking at this actual uh, mesenchymal stem cell. It's a very friendly cell. It actually likes its neighbors. As you can see, it's crawling all over the place. And then this is actually a very nice view of it. Now, at UC Davis, currently, we do have an ongoing trial that are actually enrolling patients. This is a uh, trial that's sponsored by Biomed, and this trial is not so much of uh, manipulating the cell, but it's looking at a device where we could concentrate the amount of cell that, once it's harvested from the patient's bone marrow, that gets injected into patient's leg. And as you can see that <clears throat> for this trial, it's actually injected intramuscularly while in the OR. So the doctor, while the patient's on the internal anesthesia, the doctor will go into the iliac crest and suck a whole bunch of marrow out of the patient and put this into the tube or the device. And that device is gonna get centrifuge. And after that, then cell is gonna extract it from the needle and that's gonna be injected into the patient. And the hope is that this will induce angiogenesis. So what is going on with this trial? Well, the patient we're looking for are the patient with critical limb ischemia that have no surgical or endovascular option. And currently we do have one patient that is actively enrolled. We have screened five patients and those patients have screened fail for one reason or another. What about future trial? Well, we're actually writing a grant as of now uh, with a gene-modified mesenchymal stem cell that is actually spearheaded by Jan Nota and uh, John Lair, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be part of that group. And uh, again, we're looking at patients with CLI or critical limb ischemia with either ischemic rest pain, non-healing ulceration, or digital gangrene with no surgical or endovascular option. 
And what is on the horizon? Well, hopefully we could actually enroll patients in the future with patients with less severe form PAD, which are those patients simply with intermittent claudication, and then see if stem cell will help these patients. But not to uh, switch a gear too much, but we're also looking at or submitting grants for patients with venous thromboembolism to, as you can see on how swollen that leg is, these patients often get, after patients having DVT, often gets severe form of post-thrombotic syndrome because their main conduit has been blocked, so they can no longer drain the leg. So the hope is that we can inject stem cell into these patients for, for two purposes. Non, number one is to recreate venous drainage, so we lessen the impact of, of venous congestion. And the second is actually using these cells, going directly into the clot and having these cells chew up the clot, which has been actually established in uh, animal models, as well as some human study that was in, done in China. <coughs> And then last but not least, about patients with lymphedema. Lymphedema is a morbid condition whereby the patients uh, may have a lymph node removed because of surgery or having infection or many different reasons, that they no longer have the lymphatic drainage. And these patients often end up with a um, uh, swollen leg, very, very disfiguring uh, condition. And hope, the hope is that stem cell will actually recreate the lymphatic drainage pattern and to relieve um, the issues in these patients. I know it's a lot of slide to digest, but I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Willie, and, and Willie will be here afterwards because with the Biomet trial already underway, I know we've had uh, a lot of patients with peripheral arterial disease approaching us about whether they qualify for this study, and uh, we're more than happy to talk to them and give them more details about this study. Thank you for leading it, Willie.